Hi, I'm Nathaniel Arcor, and I'm going to be presenting joint work with Marcelo Fiori on algebraic models of simple type theory. Before we begin, it will help to give some context to this work, which can be seen as taking a small step towards answering the question, what is a type theory? There's been quite a lot of interest in this question in recent years, but I think we're still some way from being able to give a satisfactory answer. Part of the problem is that type theory is an extremely broad subject, and perhaps it's not even reasonable to imagine there is one definitive answer. Therefore, it helps to break type theory up into smaller categories that we can more readily tackle. There are many different families of type theories, a handful of which I've written down here. For instance, we have simple type theories, polymorphic type theories, dependent type theories, substructural type theories, and so on. This is by no means a complete list, and the categories aren't disjoint either we could very well consider combinations like polymorphic dependent type theories. However, in our work, we focus on one particular family of type theories, the simple type theories. By focusing on just one class, we are actually able to give precise definitions, which allow us to establish general metatheoretic results about all type theories of a certain form. This is useful because it means that we no longer have to prove the same sorts of results again and again for similar theories to immediately get important results as part of a more general framework. One such result, for instance, is a general substitution lemma. Substitution lemmas are often notoriously long-winded and usually uninteresting. In our framework, we show that all simple type theories satisfy a substitution lemma, which means lengthy structural induction proofs are not necessary. What is a simple type theory? Here we have two natural deduction rules which are epitomic of the structure of simple type theories. On the top, we have the introduction rule for product types, and on the bottom, we have the introduction rule for function types. The first thing to note is that the types of a simple type theory have algebraic structure. We can combine types, for instance, by taking their product or function space. In fact, the structure of types is exactly that expressible in universal algebra. Secondly, the terms themselves have multi-sorted algebraic structure. For instance, the pairing operator takes two terms of potentially different types and produces a new term, their pair. However, the structure on terms is more expressive than algebraic structure, as it also permits operators to bind variables in the operands. The term structure is therefore given by multi-sorted binding algebraic structure. The canonical example of a variable binding operator is a lambda abstraction operator in a simply type lambda calculus, but other kinds of variable binding operators are also common, for example in case splitting or let binding. Note that binding algebraic structure is described by natural deduction rules whose context may be extended by fresh variables. In addition to the structure of type and term operators, we also have equational structure. In a simple type theory, we may declare both types and terms to be judgmentally equal. Finally, we have a notion of capture avoiding substitution for terms, which is necessitated by the variable binding structure. Capture avoiding substitution is needed, for instance, to express the beta rule for function application. In summary then, we consider a simple type theory to be some structure with algebraic type operators and multi-sorted binding term operators, as well as a notion of capture avoiding substitution on terms and equations on both types and terms. This structure might seem overly basic, but even these simple type theories suffice to capture many interesting examples. For instance, both the unityped and simply typed lambda calculi, as well as the computational lambda calculus and the simply typed lambda calculus with sums, are all examples of simple type theories, as well as examples outside computer science, such as partial differentiation and predicate logic. Now, the distinction between syntax and type theory is often overlooked, but it is important to distinguish between them in order to prove some important metatheoretic results, such as the substitution lemma that I mentioned earlier. In our work, we call the fragment of simple type theories without substitution or equations simply type syntax. Equations are deemed non-syntactic because they identify syntactically unequal terms, while substitution is part of the metatheory rather than a purely syntactic operation. We're not going to look at signatures and equational presentations for simple type theories in depth, because I want to focus on our models. In brief though, 
The typical natural deduction rules for type formation, introduction, elimination and computation can be described formally by signatures and equation presentations, similarly to those in universal algebra, but which additionally capture typing and binding information. These signatures induce polynomial functors, whose algebras will form part of the structure of our models. We'll look at an example in more depth later, but for now I want to move on to describe the structure of the models of simple type theories. Let's consider the structure that is involved in a simple type theory. Here we have the typical form of a term judgment. We can see that there are three aspects we shall need to consider. The structure of the variable contexts, the structure of the terms, and the structure of the types. These correspond roughly to the different kinds of judgment in a simple type theory. Note that when we describe the term structure, we also need to give an account of the substitution structure. Terms may contain variables that are bound by the context, and which may be substituted by new terms. Let's start by looking at the structure of types in a model of simple type theory. The types are actually given exactly as in universal algebra, in which we have a set of elements, which are here the types, closed under enary operations and subject to various equations. We can thus represent the type structure as a functor algebra. Here, S is a set of sorts or types. Sigma is the functor induced by the type signature for the simple type theory. I glossed over this before, but we'll see an example in just a moment. Finally, the denotation function ensures that the set of sorts is closed under the type forming operators. Here's an example of the algebraic structure for the types of the simply type lambda calculus. Here, the set of sorts S is closed under forming product types, function types, and the unit type. Next, let's look at the structure of variable contexts. A context structure is given by a small category C whose objects represent contexts and whose morphisms represent variable renamings. The canonical examples of variable renamings are the structural operations of exchange, weakening and contraction, which are going to be present in every simple type theory. The set of sorts S that we described previously embeds into the category of context C as a single variable context. For instance, if we have a type A in S, then A embeds into the category C as a singleton context X of type A. The category of contexts must have a terminal object which represents the empty context. And for each context gamma and type A, we must be able to form their product. This represents extending the context gamma by a fresh variable of type A. However, we don't require the category C to be Cartesian which means that in general, contexts cannot be concatenated. Finally, let's consider the structure of terms. Terms will be fibred over their types, which means that we associate a unique type to each term. Here, S is again the set of sorts, while T is a set of terms. Tau assigns a type to each term. However, I'm oversimplifying slightly, because we don't just consider closed terms. Each term lives in some context gamma, so actually the set of terms is going to be indexed over the category of contexts. Instead, T will be given by a presheaf on the category of contexts, that is, a functor from CEOP into set. Tau will be given by a natural transformation. Technically, S is a presheaf too, but since types don't depend on their context in the simple type theory, S will be given by the constant presheaf on the set of sorts. More explicitly, we can consider sets of terms natural in their context. For each context gamma, we have a set of terms in that context, and a function assigning a type to each term. As with types, we consider algebraic structure on terms. Here though, the algebraic structure lives in the presheaf category, which allows us to describe binding algebraic structure. By fibering over S, we can additionally describe multi-sorted structure, Note that this means the algebra lives in the slice category over S, rather than directly in the presheaf category. If you're familiar with polynomial functors, you might already spot that this structure is suggestive of a polynomial algebra. Similarly to the structure for types, the term signature induces a functor sigma on the presheaf slice category. The natural transformation term 
ensures that T is closed under the term operations. Let's look at an explicit example. Here, T squared, together with a composite map along the bottom, tau squared followed by the denotation of the product type constructor, is given by the application of the functor sigma to the type term structure T to S. The algebra structure means that T is closed under taking pairs of terms, such that the type of each pair is given by projecting the types of each component and then taking a denotation of the product of the two types. It may not be entirely obvious at first, but this is exactly the structure we should expect for a pairing operation on terms. We'll see a more sophisticated example of algebraic term structure shortly, but first we must discuss the substitution structure on terms. There are two aspects to substitution structure that we need to consider. First, we should be able to project variables from contexts into terms. A type term structure has variables if we have a map from V into T. But how is the pre-sheet V defined? Well, for each context gamma, V of gamma is a set of variables in that context. Concretely, V is given by the Eneda embedding of each type which is viewed as a one-variable context using the embedding of S into the category of contexts. The natural transformation nu is given by projecting out the type of each variable. T being an algebra of a V amounts to T being closed under variable projections. That is, variables in a context may be treated as terms in that same context. The second aspect of substitution is the action of substitution itself Again, this is represented as an algebra in the pre sheaf slice category. T subscript A represents all the terms of type A. Concretely, this is given by a pullback over the type A, viewed as a global element of S. Exponentiation by the pre sheaf of variables V is equivalent to context extension by a single variable. This follows fairly directly from the INA dilemma. Here, Tb to Va corresponds to the set of terms of type B in a context extended by a variable of type A. Drawing this all together, we can see that this functor algebra represents closure under the following substitution operator. That is, given a term T of type B in a context extended by a variable X of type A and another term A of type A, we can substitute A for X in T to form a new term of type B. Actually though, the substitution lemma will establish that substitution is admissible, so this new term will be equal to an existing one. Substitution additionally has to satisfy a number of coherence conditions. For instance, substitution is associative, unital, and must commute with the operators of the type theory, but we're not going to go into details here. We've now briefly looked at the structure required of our models of simple type theory. As with the conceptual distinction between syntax and type theory for signatures and presentations, we also have a corresponding distinction between models of simply type syntax and models of simple type theories. Only models of simple type theories are required to have substitution structure and potentially satisfy equations on types and terms. This ensures we preserve the clear distinction between syntax and type theory Note that I haven't discussed homomorphisms of models here at all, though they play an important role. Defining the homomorphisms turns out to be quite technical, as we have to account for homomorphisms between polynomial algebras for polynomial functors that are defined on different pre sheaf categories, as a category of context may differ. But for details, I'll refer you to our paper. Once we have defined the models of simple type theories, we're in a position to prove general results about the entire class of simple type theories. In our paper, we established three important meta-theorems. The first is an initiality theorem, familiar from traditional treatments of categorical type theory. The initiality theorem says that every simple type theory has an initial model, which coincides with a syntactic term model construction. This justifies the use of the simple type theory as an internal language for its models, as there is a unique homomorphism from the syntactic model to any other model, given by structural induction on the terms. 
The second result is that every simple type theory has an associated substitution lemma. Intuitively, this means that capture avoiding substitution is admissible in every simple type theory. This is important practically, as it avoids the necessity of manually proving substitution lemmas for any type theory that is covered by the framework. Third, we establish a general Lambert correspondence theorem, which subsumes the classical correspondence between the simply typed lambda calculus and Cartesian closed categories. More precisely, there is an equivalence between models of simple type theories that admit a form of simultaneous substitution and Cartesian multicategories with corresponding structure reflecting the polynomial algebraic structure. This gives a concrete correspondence between type theory and category theory for the family of simple type theories. Let's quickly summarise the story so far. I've given a brief outline of our general framework for the syntax and semantics of simple type theories, along with several of the meta-theorems concerning simple type theories. This framework can be seen in the context of a starting point to progressing towards more expressive classes of type theories, such as those mentioned at the beginning of the talk. However, given the ubiquity of simple type theories, this framework is already useful and is sufficient for many interesting examples of type theories. Before I finish though, there's one aspect I haven't talked about at all, but I want to briefly mention because it forms an intrinsic part of our approach. Earlier, I completely glossed over the relationship between signatures and polynomial functors, but this is actually a central idea in our approach. More specifically, one thesis of our work is an understanding of natural deduction rules as presenting polynomials, and hence polynomial functors. I'm going to try to give you a small taste of this observation in the last few minutes. I'm going to give you a lightning quick introduction to polynomials. You might alternatively know polynomials by the name index containers, but if you're not familiar with either of these concepts, don't worry. I'm just going to give you some intuition of the construction. The main point to keep in mind is that a polynomial is a diagram of this shape in some category C. We're going to see how you can build a polynomial like this from a natural deduction rule. We can take polynomials in any locally Cartesian closed category, which intuitively means that we have a notion of dependent sum and dependent product. In particular, the locally Cartesian closed categories we will consider are the pre sheaf categories over the categories of contexts. Every polynomial in C induces a functor between slice categories of C called a polynomial functor. The name polynomial functor comes from its familiar shape, which is suggestive of a polynomial function, that is, is a sum of products of variables. Polynomials induce polynomial functors in the same way that coefficients induce polynomial functions. Here though, we also have a notion of variable reindexing that isn't present with polynomial functions. If that feels too fast, don't worry. I'm just going to try to give an intuition for what's going on, so you don't need to understand it fully. Let's take a look at a familiar natural deduction rule. This is the introduction rule for products from the simply typed lambda calculus. I'm going to show you how this rule induces a polynomial in a pre sheaf category. First, Note that this rule is implicitly universally quantified over every pair of types A and B. That is, A and B are type metavariables, and they will form the first part of our polynomial. S here is the set of sorts, like before. The rightmost component of the polynomial describes the conclusion of the natural deduction rule. Here, the conclusion type is always given by the product of the two type metavariables for which we use the algebraic structure of the types S. Next, we look to the premises. For each premise, we give a copy of the type metavariables. Formally, each premise has its own type metavariables, A and B. To expand a little more, we consider two copies of the type metavariable A and the type metavariable B, one for each premise. The middle map of the polynomial is going to unify these distinct metavariables. In this example, it's not completely clear why this component is important. 
That's because the importance of this map is really only seen when one considers variable binding operators, which is what we shall look at next. Finally, the leftmost component of the polynomial describes the input types. Here, the first premise is type A, so we take the first projection, which corresponds to the first type meta variable, i.e., A. The second premise has type B, which corresponds to the second type meta variable, so we take the second projection, i.e., B. The natural reduction rule, prod intro, therefore induces the given polynomial. As I mentioned earlier, every polynomial induces a polynomial functor. We now ask what algebras for this polynomial functor look like. In this case, an algebra for the polynomial functor induced by this polynomial is given by a type term structure, t to s, along with a map pair, such that the given square commutes. This means that t is closed under taking the pair of two terms in two types a and b, such that the type of the pair is equal to the product of the two constituent types. We can simplify this structure to get the following, which we see is exactly the structure of the pairing operator that I described earlier in the talk. Indeed, it is a general fact that algebras for the polynomial functor induced by the polynomial induced by a natural deduction rule are type term structures, t to s, that model that natural deduction rule. Let's see one more example to gain a little more intuition for the construction. Here we have a second example of a natural deduction rule in the simply type lambda calculus, corresponding to function introduction or lambda abstraction. Crucially, this one is different because it is a binding operator. The lambda abstraction operator takes some term in an extended context and binds the extending variable. We're going to see how this too induces a polynomial. Like before, the rule is implicitly universally quantified over two type meta variables a and b. And, like before, the type meta variables will form the first part of the polynomial. The rightmost component of the polynomial is once again given by the conclusion type, and in this case the structure is very similar to that of the rule for product introduction. The premises are where things diverge slightly from the product rule. For one thing, we only have a single premise, but additionally, that premise binds a variable. We still have one copy of the type meta variables per premise, but this time it's a little different. Instead of representing the type meta variable A by the set of sorts S like before, it's instead going to be represented by the pre-sheaf of variables V. This is because we need to record the fact that A is a type of a bound variable in the context. The middle map of the polynomial projects out the type of the variable. The leftmost component of the polynomial once again represents the input type, in this case the type meta variable B, which is given by the second projection. The natural deduction rule for function introduction in simply type lambda calculus is thus given by this polynomial. We can once again ask what the algebras are for the polynomial functor induced by this polynomial. An algebra for the polynomial is given by a type term structure, t to s, along with a map abs interpreting the lambda abstraction operation. Recall from before that exponentiation by the pre-sheaf of variables phi is equivalent to context extension. That is, Tb to Va represents the terms of type B in a context extended by a variable of type A. In this way, we can see that the commutativity of this square exactly represents the structure of lambda abstraction. I've just covered two examples here, but in general, every natural deduction rule for simple type theory induces a polynomial in a similar manner. The general construction is slightly more complicated, so for the full details, I'll refer you to our paper. Let me sum up, and then I shall finish. In our paper, we give a general framework for simple type theories, describing their syntax and semantics, and establishing several meta-theorems. 
The work is motivated by the perspective that natural deduction rules induce polynomials whose polynomial functor algebras are models for the corresponding natural deduction rule. Hopefully this has been enough to whet your appetite for the paper, which goes into much more detail and covers many more examples. Thank you for listening.